All right, hi there, guys. This is Professor Hildebrandt. This is the final uh, third part of a lecture on Chapter 7, Unemployment and Inflation. And so in Part C here, I'm going to specifically be talking about the topic of inflation. If you missed those videos on unemployment, please swing back and watch both um, so that you'll be prepared for the next exam. So you've probably heard this term before, inflation or inflation rate. So let's talk about what that is. So inflation we describe as an overall increase in the level of prices that are prevalent in our economy. Okay, so we talked in an earlier chapter, chapter five, about the idea of a price level, right? This composite measure that talks about the overall uh, what we see happening to prices in our macro economy. And so inflation then is when that price level is increasing from quarter to quarter or from year to year. So how do we measure then this idea of inflation or increasing prices? Well, we have what we call the inflation rate. <clears throat> and so it's the rate at which that price level increases on an annual basis. And we're going to be pulling out one of those formulas that, again, we've used in earlier chapters that I simply call the percentage change formula. We're going to take the new price level. We'll subtract from that the previous price level, divide by the previous, and again, because it is a rate, we're going to multiply by 100. So the CPI, I mentioned this some. Um, we talked through the CPI in Chapter 6, but just to go over it again here, this is the price index that we use the most often here in the United States to gauge what our inflation is for the year. So we take this market basket of goods and services, and over time, we track changes in the price. Um, and as the consumer price index changes, goes up or down, that shows, for the most part, what's happening in terms of inflation in our economy. How do we determine the basket? Um, we do a consumer survey, um, expenditure surveys. Now, I will say this basket is not going to be representative of all American families. It's actually um, urban consumer information that's used for the CPI. Um, and again, then how is it calculated? Well, we look at <coughs> those price changes. <coughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, based on the spending habits of the population. Again, this is a formula that we've seen before, but make sure that you guys are comfortable with this. So you're going to calculate the cost of the basket in the current year, and then divide that by whatever the cost of the basket is in the base year. Um, how do we get the cost of the basket? So the cost of our basket, well, each good that's in your um, basket, you take the quantity of that good, good A, and you multiply times the price of good A. And then you add to that however many of good B we have times whatever the cost was of B, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Again, this was the formula I showed you guys earlier. This is how we're going to get our inflation rate. Um, and so you could... Um, you know, take any two of these years, okay, here, and plug into this formula to calculate the rate of inflation. And I have a video that focuses specifically on that, so I'm not going to do that right here at this moment. So here we have some graphs showing uh, this first one here, graph A, showing how our CPI has changed over time. Um, we are using still as a base year for the CPI, the time period of 1982 to 84. So that's why right here, the CPI is 100 because your price index is always 100 in the base year. Um, and so you can see a lot of the inflation that we've experienced here in the U.S. Um, has definitely uh, come more recently. <coughs> we were you know, pretty flat for a while there. Um, the second graph down here is showing the annual percent change um, in that inflation rate. And we did have one period right here um, during the summer of, I want to say it was the summer of 2010, where we dabbled a bit in what we call deflation. We'll talk about that here in a second. So let's, uh, let's work a question here and see if we can solve this together. So last year's CPI is 159. This year's is 154. 
then this year's inflation rate is what? And so again, I'm going to use that percent change formula. So new minus old over old times 100. Okay. And so the new is the 154. So 154. Last year's was 159. We're going to divide by 159, multiply times 100. Okay. So here's what we have then. 154 minus 159 is minus 5. Um, and times 100 then is minus 500 over 159. And so if you plug that into a calculator, 500 divided by 159, you would get negative 3.14% as our rate of inflation. So the answer here is A, which actually then means we did not experience inflation. We experienced deflation. So prices from this first year to the second actually decreased by a little more than 3%. Well, what causes inflation? That should be something we need to consider as well. Not just what is inflation, but what can cause it. So we have three main um, components here. Uh, the first two happen in the short run. So negative supply shocks. This just means something that causes a decrease in aggregate supply. Um, positive demand shocks. So something that causes an increase in aggregate demand or in the long run, simply printing money. Um, it's never a good idea if your government decides just to um, hit the print button and go crazy on increasing your money supply. <clears throat> so the first one, demand, we call it demand pull inflation. So prices will rise as output rises and unemployment falls. And we saw this happen in the late 1960s. We had increased government spending and expanded social programs um, after the Vietnam War. And it resulted in some inflation. So here we have demand shifting to the right from D1 to D2. And so you can see our price level increased from 145 to 150. <coughs> the second source then of inflation is called cost push. Again, we call this a negative supply shock. Um, and so as aggregate supply, and this should say aggregate, sorry you guys, AS and AD, but... We're good. Um, as prices prices are going to rise at, while output is actually falling and unemployment is rising. So this one is definitely more problematic. <clears throat> we experienced this in the United States during the 1970s. We saw increased cost of production from worldwide crop failures and the OPEC embargo that caused oil prices to soar. That combination led to a decrease in aggregate supply, so it shifted to the left. And so our, you can see here in this example price level increased from 150 to 160. Um, recently, if we look at stable and developed economies, they've typically seen inflation rates between about 0 and 4%. In the United States, our average is about 2% inflation each year. Well, that's a nice messed up graph, but this was supposed to show you guys um, 2017 inflation rates from the CIA World Factbook. Um, and again, you can see the U.S. there was at 2.1%. Um, you had France at 1.2%. Japan was really low at only half a percent. And then you had Argentina, oh my, over 25% inflation. We have a term for that too. It's called hyperinflation. So more on that in one second. Um, and so this graph was just showing changes in our CPI. Again, that measure of inflation from 1914 to 1971. So you can see we've had high ups, high downs, um, but we haven't really experienced this deflation um, really in present times, right? Recent decades. Um, and then this was looking more specifically of the period 1971 to 2000. We did, again, have some struggles with inflation, getting kind of high in the 1970s. Again, this was the crop failures and the OPEC embargo really did cause some problems for our macro economy here. Um, and then here we go more recently, 2001 to 2017. And again, so excuse me earlier, I misspoke. It was the summer of 2009 where we dipped our toes a tad in deflation. So three important terms here when it comes to inflation. So just the regular inflation, which we've been talking about, an increase in our price level, 
deflation, I've mentioned this a couple of times now, a decrease in the price level. So inflation would be like prices go up 2%, okay? Deflation would mean prices go down maybe 3%, so it'd be negative. Notice, though, there's a third term, disinflation. So what this means is that we still had inflation, but it was less than the previous year. So maybe year one, we experience inflation of 2%. And then in year two, we still have inflation, so prices go up, but they only go up 1%. So we would actually, comparing that to year one, to year two, we would call it disinflation. Again, a reduction in the rate of the increase in our price level. Typically, we do prefer inflation to deflation. Um, I know from a consumer perspective, you think, oh, prices are going down. That's a good thing, right? Guess what? That wage you earn, that's a price as well. You want your wages to decrease. Um, we can get into what's called a deflationary spiral. Very problematic. It is something that actually Japan for a couple of decades now has struggled with. Um, and so deflation is typically not good for an economy. <clears throat> so here we go. We have another little question here. Which years did Brazil experience deflation, right? Well, deflation means a decrease in prices. So if looking at my graph, I need something to be below the 0% and didn't happen, right? Brazil did not experience deflation um, from 1996 to 2012. So the answer would be D and none of the years shown. Okay, I mentioned this word earlier. So it's our last really term here for inflation. It's called hyperinflation, an extremely high rate of inflation. You know, sometimes we're talking 100% more a year. Um, Germany post-World War I <clears throat> experienced prices doubling every, um, I think it was like 28 hours or so, a little over a day. So in a day, prices would double. Um, and when you compound that over, you know, a month, you're talking about a severe, severe high inflation, which we would call hyperinflation. Um, and again, so this is what this is talking about here. And it was due to excessive printing. Um, and so those German paper marks basically became valueless. Um, typically, when we see periods of hyperinflation in an economy, economies result, uh, resort back to a more archaic barter system um, where money, as we know it, is no longer accepted in exchange for goods and services. Instead, you trade goods for other goods. Um, and here's just a picture showing all of the money that was basically worthless, okay? Um, and kids would play with it because parents weren't going to use it to buy anything. So here kids have, have some blocks of paper bills to play with. Um, more recently, we've seen some issues with hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, um, Venezuela. Uh, so it's still something that countries can experience today. Um, there you go. A loaf of bread in August of 06 cost 45,000 Zimbabwean dollars. Two years later, that same loaf of bread was 10 million Zimbabwean dollars. Okay, so that is hyperinflation. Um, and okay, here's a bank note from the Bank of Zimbabwe. Uh, why is this important? Look at the denominations here. It's 100 trillion dollars. Okay, that's how bad their hyperinflation um, had gotten to. Okay, uh, there's a part in the chapter that talks a little about relative price. So I'll just touch on it for a second. Relative price is simply a price of a good expressed in terms of another good. So if the price of a candy bar is 50 cents and a burger costs a dollar, then the relative price of a burger is two candy bars. So just a concept that I think it's important for y'all to know. All right, moving on. So then we go to talking a little bit about interest rates. Um, I mentioned earlier that we will use the concept of supply and demand throughout this course. So here is another example. This is the loanable funds market. And so this brings together basically borrowers and savers and an exchange is going to take place, right? I want to borrow money so I can buy a house. You want to save money so you can earn interest and then use that later on. Um, and so where the supply and demand intersect is the interest rate that would be charged. If we're talking about the nominal interest rate, 
It's the interest rate expressed in dollars of current value. I, I call them current year dollars. Um, this means it's not been adjusted for inflation. This is what your loan agreement says, right? You go out to buy a new car and they tell you a 5% interest rate. That's your nominal interest rate, okay? It's very different from the real interest rate because this one is actually expressing dollars of what we call constant purchasing power because it has been adjusted for inflation. So how do we get the real interest rate? Well, you take that nominal interest rate, let's say the 5% that was on my bank loan, and you subtract out whatever the uh, inflation rate was for that year, perhaps 2%, giving us a real inflation rate of 3%, or excuse me, real interest rate. Um, this was just showing some differences in how inflation can differ in different metro areas. Um, and so you can see some were uh, almost as low as 1%, and then we had others approaching 25 a little over 2.5%. Um, and our trend in terms of worldwide um, has been lower inflation rates over the past few decades. Okay, the U.S. is this kind of goldenrod line. Europe is blue. Japan is green. And again, you can see here's your 0% line. If I could draw a straight line. So Japan, again, as mentioned, has struggled a bit um, with that uh, issue of deflation. Okay, guys, so that's all I've got for Chapter 7. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions.